You are listening to a universe of possibilities. This is Astronomy FM. Coming up next, an Astronomy.fm original program. It's time for York Universe, a co-production of the Observatory of York University, Toronto, and the Voice of Astronomy. AFM Radio. AFM Hello Radio. and AFM. welcome to York Universe, the astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. I'll be one of your hosts this evening. I'm Dr. Elena Hyde, and I'm joined tonight by the amazing Blake Nankurl. We are broadcasting live from the Alan I. Carswell Observatory, located at York University in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. As a reminder, this is Science Night in Canada, where the lineup is all Canadian, starting with ourselves, York Universe, then on to Western Worlds, Quirks and Quarks, and Science for the People. York Universe broadcasts every Monday night at 9 p.m. local Toronto time, or Tuesday morning at about 2 a.m. UT, if, if that helps. The York Universe production works in concert with our on online public viewing. That's right, it's happening at the same exact time, uh, run by our observatory team at the hours of 9 to 10 p.m. local Toronto time. So if you're listening live, you can actually join in right now. Head on over to www.yorku.ca slash science slash observatory and follow the links to OPV for online public viewing. Join in the chat. You can also click on any of the YouTube links you see on there that will take you to our AICO YouTube channel where you can see the live viewing. That's what's going on tonight. Our broadcast is powered by and in partnership with astronomy.fm, the voice of astronomy. If you have any questions or comments about past shows or suggestions for future topics, you can always email us at observe at yorku.ca. You can also connect with us on Twitter if you're on the social media uh, at York Observatory or York Universe and Instagram at York U Observatory and Facebook at Ellen A. Carswell OBS. All of our programs are free, but if you'd like to make a donation, you can see that website I mentioned before. And in the meantime, we are monitoring the chat room over on YouTube for questions. Our crew is posting wonderful content and the current weather is, well, Toronto strangeness. It's very cloudy and um, unfortunately raining. So we are posting images, but mostly stock images for you to see over on YouTube. Um, but you can still join in the conversation, chat with our crew and have a good time. I don't expect it's going to clear tonight. <laughs> it does seem like it's determined to have not just very high humidity and high temperatures, but actual rain coming down. How's the weather where you are, Blake? It's uh, overcast here. So uh, it was raining earlier today, but uh, I haven't looked out lately. Yeah, it's it's been a, a cross between rain and haze and humidity here. So I think just the whole general sort of Toronto general area and probably most of Ontario is not having a great time with the weather at the moment. Um, we do seem to have slightly improved air quality from the smoke, but of course clouds moving in means we we still can't really observe past it. Now, normally we would do a bunch of different things in this show. We have This Week in Space and Astronomy History, um, but we're going to actually be doing some discussion today as well because we have Blake Nancarol with us, who is an expert on the RASC Observing Certificate programs. So before we get to that part of it, um, we're going to just go ahead and talk a little bit about some of the cool things that have happened in space and astronomy history um, around this date in the uh, back in time. So as a reminder, for those of you who are like me, very bad at keeping track of the dates, <laughs> today is the 26th of June, 2023, if you can believe it. Um, I don't know, it still feels like we're living in the future to me, but I'm just going to take us back in time a little bit. Not that long, actually. We'll just go back to uh, 2000. <laughs> it's, uh, I don't know it's, how long it is. Depends on how old you are, I suppose. It seems like yesterday to me. June 22nd, 2000. And of course, um, those of you who've heard my broadcast before probably can guess. I Yes, it's about Mars. Um, June 22nd in 2000, there was a lovely discovery or evidence, I should say, of liquid water on Mars, June 22nd in the year 2000. And I remember this being a absolutely huge deal in uh, in Arizona and Tucson, where I was at the, uh, the University of Arizona at the time. It was absolutely massive. 
everybody was talking about the possibility of liquid water on Mars. And this actually came thanks to Mars Global Surveyor. The, um, the evidence that was coming out were gullies, which were shown in some of the pictures with, uh, with channels and what are called alcoves and little apron features inside the, uh, the pictures. And these pictures, which were new in 2000, uh, from Mars uh, Global Surveyor, were all, came out of the um, the mock or the Mars Orbiter Camera. So, apologies for the lots of acronyms, but um, we do have uh, you know a lot of those in in astronomy. So, if you're not familiar with Mars, it's a little less massive than Earth. It has lower gravity. It has a very different atmosphere. Lots of carbon dioxide and not a lot of anything else, um, very thin, which means that the pressure and uh, you know water don't behave like they do on Earth. If you have liquid water on Mars, it can't actually exist very long. It'll do what's called sublimation, where if, if you start off with a puddle of liquid, it will go straight to a gas. Um, so it's going to just whoosh, straight out. Uh, it sort of immediately sorts of boils, evaporates, and freezes all at the same time. So it's very unpleasant. But um, there, this was, I think, from my mind anyways, one of the really big renaissances in the way that we were thinking about liquid water on Mars and out there in the solar system. And the idea that there might actually be quite a lot of water in Mars, uh, just not on the surface, um, this was you know, a great start. So there's a whole bunch of beautiful pictures that you can search up. Um, they're usually on jpl.nasa and you can get, um, you know, pictures of some of the basic Martian gullies and um, these first set from Mock were uh, just absolutely lovely. Um, so I do recommend those two uh, uh, Mars Global Surveyor uh, images and the high resolutions can be downloaded directly from mars.nasa.gov if anyone is interested. Most of the gully landforms were found interestingly on crater slopes or slopes facing away from midday sunlight and they were mostly between latitudes of 30 and 70 degrees in both Martian hemispheres. So the relationship to sunlight and latitude sort of indicated that maybe ice was playing some kind of role in protecting liquid water from evaporation, maybe until enough pressure builds for it to be released catastrophically down a slope. And it's evidence, I mean, obviously they weren't uh, having high enough resolution to zoom in and see water as you would like from a video camera on earth watching a, I don't know, the old faithful geyser in Yellowstone or something. <laughs> um, um, they had to infer that it was water based on its reactions with the gullies and the fact that you had gullies that were not there before. So this means that, uh, you know, there's features being very fresh. We have images of before and after. So liquid water could be on Mars at depths of less than 500 meters was what this was indicating. And that actually has been... Um, widely supported since then. So there, those of you who are interested in water on Mars and its behavior on Mars, uh, this was actually a really, really fun time. So if you're interested in the Mars Global Surveyor, um, which was responsible for these images, I I do recommend it. Unfortunately, it's, it's um, you know, not entirely there anymore. So uh, Mars Global Surveyor completed its primary mission in January of 2001 and was in its third extended mission phase on 2006. And at that point, it sort of stopped responding to messages and commands. There was a little faint signal detected a few days after it stopped um, saying that I'm in, I'm in safe mode. So it's kind of actually a nice story because this Mars Global Surveyor, the last thing it sent to Earth was literally, I'm safe. And uh, that was that was kind of it. Um, so we believe it's in a stable near polar circular orbit and it's uh, expected to crash into the planet around 2050. So I'm not sure if that's actually something to look forward to or not, <laughs> but it did a huge amount of work while it was up there. So not only this uh, water discovery with the gullies, but it actually had you know a, an extended mission phase. So it did last longer than its original um, 
its original mission was planned. And, you know, it did quite well while it was there. It had the mock, which was, again, the one that we were talking about for our, our little This Week in Space and Astronomy history. This was operated by Malin Space Science Systems. And I'm actually not sure if this is the same one that does Malin Cam, but I would be kind of surprised if they weren't related a little bit. Um, but the mock, or originally known as the Mars Observer Camera or Mars Orbiter Camera, depending on when you got introduced to it, it has a, um, a narrow angle camera, which took black and white high resolution images and red and blue wide angle pictures for context. And then it would do daily global imaging. So it would actually return about, um, you know, 240,000 images. Um, spanning portions of about 4.8 Martian years between 1997 and 2006. So this was a, a really, really good monitoring system for Mars. Um, a couple shout outs to instruments we didn't actually talk about, but the Mars uh, Orbiter Laser Altimeter, just to make sure I say that right, um, or MOLA, this was actually looking at topography and this was operating at as an altimeter until the laser sort of stopped responding in about 2001. There was also thermal emission spectrometer or TESS, which mapped the mineral composition by scanning for thermal emissions and a magnetometer looking at electro electron uh, um, reflectometer. So this was looking at the planet's magnetic fields. So Mars, unlike Earth, does not have an active magnetic field. This is something that potentially future Martians might have to worry about, but um, it does have areas of residual magnetic field. So where the magnetic field has kind of been embedded inside the crust and that could maybe give you some localized protection. It was a really cool mission, a really great um, uh, camera. And I'll just give an extra little shout out to the mock images for gullies seen on Martian cliffs in uh, the 22nd of June year two thousand. Um, a little bit of fun to start us off with uh, with this week in space and astronomy history. So uh, Blake, do you remember where you were in 2000? Uh, <laughs> that um, I was in many places in 2000. It's <laughs> a long, but long I, time I, ago. <laughs> I, I remember I remember some of the imagery because they were they were really colorful. Yeah. Uh, so I, I quite like those. I, a few of those I captured and are on my, you know, um, um, image gallery that comes up when my computer's in standby mode. Yeah, exactly. And it's um, it's definitely worth noting that being able to capture so much of the surface with something like a real color, um, it really brought home just how dynamic the surface of Mars really is, um, sort of bringing it back to life in our imaginations, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I'll go ahead and pass over to you, Blake. Do you want to talk about the um, your your next uh uh, space and astronomy history item, or do you want to do a little bit of the um, uh, looking at, you know, sort of programs and talking about that? I can do a history item if you like. All right, let's go ahead and finish up those. I know you've got a, shall I say, explosive one, <laughs> so yeah. I'll, pass, I'll pass over to you. And and ironically, this is history and now, because this is something <laughs> that has occurred in a galaxy very very far away i don't know the actual distance but let's say it's a million light years away so this happened actually a million years ago perhaps but we're seeing it now i'm talking ab about the supernova there's been a lot of talk about a supernova lately um specifically sn2023 ixf and I've seen a lot of people asking about the supernova, if it's visible, if I can see it in my telescope, if I could image it with my uh, imaging rig and so on. That this is, uh, the answers to that are yes, that, that this is a, a very easily spotted uh, supernova right now. It's in the galaxy Messier 101, and, and uh, it's in, located in the southwest quadrant 
of that galaxy. Uh, Messier 101 is high in the sky all evening for people in North America. It's in the constellation Ursa Major. If you look at the last two stars in the handle of the Big Dipper, that's uh, Alcade and Mizar, and you make a, a triangle going up from the handle, that's basically where the galaxy is. Now, the estimated magnitude for the supernova right now is 11.7, 11.8. It is dimming. But that magnitude number is well within the reach of a modest telescope, like an 8-inch telescope. So if you want to visually see this supernova, you can. Uh, and it's easy with an imager system to to capture that as well. So magnitude 11.7 is no problem. This is a type 2 supernova, uh, and you'll often see it written with the Roman numeral uh, 2 or II. Uh, the type 2 supernovas result from the uh, very rapid collapse and violent explosion of a massive star. The star needs to be within a certain range in size, greater than eight times our sun, but less than 40 or 50 uh, masses of our sun. Uh, and it's distinguished from other types of supernova by examining the presence of hydrogen in the spectra. Uh, these types of uh, nova are often observed in the spiral arms of galaxies, and we're seeing that now in M101. So they're not very common in elliptical galaxies. They're generally composed of older, low-mass stars, uh, and um, uh, you can get a lot more information about the, this type of supernova from the amazing Wikipedia. So just go there and type type in uh, type two supernova. Uh, uh, by the way, this class of supernova is the same type that was co-discovered by Dr. Shelton at the University of Toronto when he uh, located supernova 1987. So there's a historical reference as well. A major unsolved problem with these types of supernovas is, is that it's not understood how uh, the burst of uh, neutrinos that occurs transfers its energy to the rest of the star that produces a shock wave, which causes the star to explode. Um, Elena, did, I was curious if you, you knew if there was much um, research may be happening in that to understand this phenomenon with the neutrinos. Yeah, I, I, I'm not a neutrino researcher, so I'll just put that out. But I have uh, read a little bit about this about this problem, and neutrino physics is really, really fun stuff. And there's some amazing things happening in Canada trying to study um, not just neutrinos but other subatomic particles and actually I'll just give a little shout out rather than you know maybe getting um, you know the neutrino physics completely wrong I'm going to give a shout out to one of our professors at York um, Professor Deborah Harris who does uh, actually specialize in neutrino interactions with nuclei and neutrino masses and mixings because neutrinos are you know the most abundant particle in the universe that has any mass, although it's by its very nature, they're a little bit strange because their mass is so low and it, they basically never interact or almost never. If it was really never, we wouldn't detect them, but almost never. Um, and they, they try to study them by looking at making beams of neutrinos and then shooting them long distances through the earth to study their composition after they've had more time to evolve. And we try to do these studies on Earth to understand what's going on, not just with supernova, but with stars. Um, because neutrino processes are going to be important for fusion, they're going to be important for star, star evolution. And um, we ha we're lucky enough to have some people who are working on uh, Dune, 
which is the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. It's really quite fun. And uh, like I said, rather than trying to give you a neutrino talk, I'm actually just going to make a little plug for the uh, the Ellen A. Carswell Observatory YouTube Teletube channel. Um, so we do have a Teletube uh, playlist where on Wednesdays we have uh, talks and guest speakers. And we actually were able to get uh, Professor Deborah Harris on uh, almost exactly two years ago to talk about her mysterious neutrino research. Um, so if, you, if you're on our website right now, joining in for the OPV, if you happen to browse through the Teletube list, um, just search for uh, Deborah Harris Neutrino, York AICO, and her video will pop up. Um, we also have Professor Randy Lewis, who we were able to capture as well, um, who talked about uh, quarks, tetraquarks, and dark matter if you're interested in particle physics in general. So I'm not going to be able to answer your question about supernova definitively, <laughs> but um, I will say that it's, it is a really, really interesting topic. And we're lucky enough to have some experts who are mm -hmm. who are actually studying it. Um, hopefully, at some point, we will get a little bit more understanding about how supernova type 2 events actually, actually work. Didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but... Uh, oh, no! <laughs> That's a great um, info. It, it's so much fun, and I'm I'm just so glad we've got people um, people studying it, right? Yes. Um, and I can't wait to figure out what they <laughs> to see what they what they come up with. <laughs> mm -hmm. So just uh, a couple of closing notes on on this: that the um, uh, supernovas, when they pop or or explode, uh, they are obviously very bright, but then they dim over time, but but that curve, the brightness curve, and, and how they dim or fade over time is very indicative of their type. So the type 2 um, is dimming at a very slow rate. So this means that, again, if you want to visually see it or photograph it, you've got a good opportunity to do that. I, I was able to image uh, the supernova uh, 2017EAW in the fireworks galaxy, or NGC 6946, I, I looked at it visually uh, as well. I started capturing images in the summer of 2017 and continued into the spring of 2018. And and one of these days, I'll take all those images and make a movie to show how the supernova is very bright, but then it fades out. That was that was a type two supernova. And uh, Elena, do you remember last year we we imaged a supernova? Do you remember? Yes, yes, I do. Um, it, and of course, I'm forgetting the exact name now because it's a whole year ago. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that, yeah. That's when uh, I was at the Killarney Provincial Park Observatory uh, in conjunction with the Alan I. Carswell Observatory. And, and there happened to be a supernova going off um, in Galaxy NGC 4647. And that was supernova... 2022 HRS. That's why I didn't remember the name. <laughs> there you go. Now that one happened to be a type one, but uh, nevertheless, we supernovas are, you know, fairly common and you can, sometimes you can easily see them with your eye. Yeah. And I believe your image did make it into your blog, didn't it? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So if folks want to see that image, it's actually still up on Blake's blog in the Astronomer in Residence Air blog site. So I've been giving you all the uh, the website over and over again, but yorku.ca slash science slash observatory. If you go to Air blog 2022, you'll actually be able to find not just uh, Blake's uh, image from the supernova, but a lot of really cool pictures because Killarney is a dark sky site. And um, yeah, it's good seeing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so we still have your whole blog up there, um, and uh, it's a lovely, lovely viewing. Highly recommended. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, do you have any other notes on your supernova item? Nope, that's it. All right. So, of course, I, I will support everybody going out and trying to view this if you have even a small telescope. Um, if you do have a uh, something like a Malin cam, which is a little bit more advanced, you'll be able to get even better imaging out of it. Um, but if you can get to dark skies, that's probably going to make the biggest difference. <laughs> uh, this is probably not something that I would try to see from the city with binoculars. It, uh, it's going to be a little bit hard. Um, of course, tonight, with it being cloudy, it's going to be hard to see. 
pretty much anything. So I'm going to go and uh, go back in time as well um, for my next item. Changing modes just a little bit from uh, from stuff that goes boom into stuff that um, I guess fortunately didn't go boom. <laughs> to, so back in 2004, we had a whole bunch of excitement on June 21st. June 21st, 2004, we had flight 15P of Spaceship 1X0, which was the first privately funded human space flight uh, from Virgin Galactic. Um, so they did actually send uh, people on this on this flight. So 15, uh, 15 P as in uh, P is in pilot, I guess. I don't actually know what the P stands for. <laughs> so this was the first privately funded human space flight back in 2004 on June 21st. It was the fourth powered test flight of the tier one uh, program from of course, uh, Virgin Galactic. So this is part of the uh, the Virgin Galactic uh, push towards space tourism. Um, and as a little side note, we might get to a news item later. They're looking at sending actual tourists, um, but uh, this year. <laughs> so this was kind of the thing that got it all started off. Of course, we had Virgin Galactic, we had uh, Blue Origin, we have SpaceX. We have all of these companies interested in space flight. But in 2004, this was pretty new. Um, there hadn't been privately funded human space flight before. So this was the fourth one. The previous three had been to much lower altitudes. So they weren't, I think, technically in space. This was a full altitude uh, test, but it wasn't a competitive flight for the Anasari X Prize, which was going on at the same time. So if those of you who remember your space flight history, this was a really cool thing. Um, I, I I remember reading about it and just being so impressed and going, oh, you know, I'm not going to win it, but this is awesome. So the Ansari X Prize was a space competition in which the X Prize Foundation offered um, 10 million dollars, I believe it was. <laughs> I don't want to say the wrong number, um, but the prize was for the first non-government organization to launch a reusable crewed spacecraft into space twice within two weeks. And the idea, of course, was to drive interest and competition and get people talking about it and working on it. And um, uh, they had, uh, um, you know, entrepreneurs, um, uh, Amir and Anusha Ansari, who actually, um, she was in space herself. I believe she spent a week or two up at the space station um, as a space tourist. So it's it's all kinds of interesting space history going on here. Uh, we have the X Prize, we have, um, and then Virgin Galactic uh, sort of powering through with the, uh, with the Spaceship 115P flight. So Virgin Galactic um, is, I believe, the, the sort of the top level organization and their series of vehicles started off with, uh, with Spaceship One. They're more comparable to um, sort of a, a hypersonic aircraft than a traditional space shuttle. They actually look more like an aircraft. And so Spaceship One was um, a really, really interesting design. It's an air-launched rocket-powered aircraft with suborbital space flight capacity, um, which is just really cool. So I, I, if you haven't seen the design yet, I recommend to go to go and look for look at it. But they have been plagued with um, with issues throughout their development. Um, so you haven't seen probably a lot of uh, Virgin Galactic launches lately, as opposed to, of course, the spaceship and um, uh, sort of the more recent Blue Origin launches. So there, there may be, haven't done as many, <laughs> but they did win the Ansari X Prize in, uh, in 2004. So it was a really interesting time in, in history, June 21st, when they, when they actually succeeded with that first privately funded human space flight 
winning the Ansari X Prize and um, really getting everybody just super, super excited. It was on December um, 17th, 2003, uh, that they they say that they um, they had the idea behind, um, uh, according to according to I suppose the um, the Virgin Galactic website. <laughs> Um, they say that the first supersonic flight was on 2003 to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the, the Wright brothers flying. So there's a little bit of fun aeronautics history in there as well. So uh, basically the idea is it's sort of, um, you know, you want to have uh, an orbiting spacecraft like a space shuttle. So ex- accelerating a spacecraft to orbital speed requires 60 times as much energy as getting it to Mach 3. Um, and you have to have a, um, you know, an elaborate heat shield to dissipate that energy during during reentry. So they had to have a plane um, that would be able to to survive um, this air launch rocket powered, um, uh, you know, uh, design, I should say. And this flight um, was really groundbreaking in a lot of ways. It was the first, and it was, um, you know, did not have necessarily the smoothest, the smoothest of all runs. Um, But it did have, uh, you know, an unexpected role. Um, They, uh, they noted that during this flight there were some strange behaviors of the craft and i think since that time it's been a lot of testing to try to make sure that it's a, a really really stable craft so hopefully that bears up in a, before their before their next real commercial flight so the makers of the spaceship one are scaled composites um and uh you know if you're not familiar with uh their designs the uh, it's a company founded by um bert Rutten, and they've life. had some really oh, amazing yeah. aeronautical uh space design components so if you love uh, mechanical oh, engineering <laughs> i definitely recommend um you know sort of looking at some of the uh some of the design changes and some of the the, the features that they actually put on um so you know it was a lot of fun they had of course a cast of thousands and um they did have uh buzz aldrin uh on site as well to sort of greet them and say uh all right we've we've made uh we've exceeded the 100 kilometer threshold which was part of winning the x prize um and but it wasn't attended as an x prize competitive flight so it wasn't actually registered as such um it didn't carry any passengers um exploration and uh, you know, it was sort of the the intended to be the final test flight before uh, making the two X Prize flights later. But they they did have, as I say, the problem with rolling and and stuff like that. So it was a win and a um, you know some lessons learned. And you know, there's a news item we might get to be discussing later, whether or not they're going to actually launch as a space tourism flight uh, industry remains to be seen. Um, but the design that they've come up with is absolutely uh, absolutely stunning so I'll go ahead and um, you know just say that I I hope (laughs) I wish them all the best and I hope that they are able to to solve their uh, their 2004 issues I mean they've had a few years to work on it so it's likely Um, and since then I I can't even think of how many different um, microbes launches we've had it's uh it's getting to the point where it's getting very hard to track the number of of companies involved in space-based endeavors um i i couldn't begin to (laughs) um so uh blake i believe you also have a launch that you were thinking about talking about do you want to do you want to cover your launch next shattered rock left sure an impact rends the landscape um, this is, again, uh, going back in time uh, a bit, and uh, actually when I was doing a bit of research here, I I thought about your uh, expression about telescopes. What, what do you always say about telescopes? Telescopes make the best spaceships. There you go. <laughs> It's I, I I can't resist saying it. I don't know. Um, it's just it just seems like so true to me. <laughs> Hello, mm-hmm. to Western Worlds. So this is about the most 
telescope. Thank you. How are you, Raymond? I'm Most well. stands for micro variability you were talking and about oscillations of stars, and, of that process. and yes. that translates okay. well so both in we English and French. This is a, a, a Canadian Earth, product. It's, it's Canada's first space, space telescope, to and it at the time it was the smallest space telescope put into orbit. And because of that, the constraints on the size and and uh, com coming from a country with its first sort of effort, there was kind of an interesting nickname that was given to the most. It was called the Humble Space Telescope. And I, I think most people will understand the reference there. So how big was it? 53 kilograms. And if you measured that out, 60 centimeters wide, 60 centimeters tall, 24 centimeters deep. So that, that's about the size of an extra large suitcase or a, a small chest. And it put it in the micro satellite category. It's a joint effort with the Canadian Space Agency, Dynacon Enterprises Limited, which is now Micro Satellite System Canada, uh, Space Flight Laboratory, or SFL which is associated with the University of Toronto Institute of Aerospace Studies and the University of British Columbia. This was led by the principal investigator James B. Matthews. So in, in uh, 2004, uh, some of the notable discoveries started and uh, the star Procyon was found to not oscillate to the extent that it had been been expected. In 2006, it revealed that a previously unknown class of variable star, the slowly pulsating B supergiant, um, that was a new class. In 2011, it detected the transits of the of exoplanet 55 Cancri E. Uh, of its primary star based on two weeks of nearly continuous uh, observing. Mm -hmm. And, and that confirmed an early de uh, detection, and it allowed subsequent investigations into that planet's uh, composition. And in 2019, photometry was used to disprove claims of permanent sunspots on the surface of the star HD 189733. The pointing accuracy was pretty uh, renowned for, for the time not an uh, with an However, error less than one arc second. Uh, the launch this date was because it provides a habitat for uh, June 30th, 20, rocks, in uh, 2003, like excuse me. It was deactivated in March 2019. You can learn lots about this, uh, obviously go into your favorite search tool and, and search for the most telescope, uh, lots of great information. But I, I, I like this because it's a bit of flag waving, um, Canada's first space telescope, um, and it and it did some great okay. stuff. So I'm interested in that first statement about porosity. So oh yeah, absolutely. Yes. And yeah. you know, so um, for for a less of a size yeah. than yes. a single yeah. star lake, yeah. I might add. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you know, this all of these things, you know, the um, and I I, I forgot. Did, did you mention the exoplanet transits? Yeah. 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 And um, the exoplanet transits and everything else. All of this for less than a single one of the you know, size of one starling. So it's, it's, I mean, by all accounts, it's an amazing success. And I think, you know, it really helped show the value of these very smaller, small satellites. And when you, when you start doing things um, that, you know, do a lot with a very small amount of space, all of a sudden it becomes more feasible to get your payload added to a launch. And a lot of really cool science initiatives came out of this idea of small satellites or um, you said micro satellite or shoebox satellite um, sizes and uh, you know there's now all kinds of different interesting experiments going of you know very very small size uh, sizes um, and you know we say small sizes but, you know 100 pounds or you know, 50 kilograms that's that's a pretty small little spacecraft up there um, 
colliding together. And, you, can also you know, I think it's great to have, you know, a lot of science of happening so on a small scale example. because and it, there you it makes it more available to things the like the, um, the, the, the students, uh, the SEDS group, the students for exploration and development of space, I think. I hope I'm not getting that acronym wrong. But physics students and astronomy students can be involved with these small satellites and even, you know, classes can get involved with them now. And it's it's really, you know, um, the impact event you, that getting us kickstarted back that, in that was in 2003. And, Since um, then, we've of course seen um, a, a lot of uh, very small satellites, satellites right? Yes. That, that are small, you know the size like of a toaster. And and yeah, yeah, and even that smaller. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and you know, really, really, really tiny ones that are what's kind of proposed for the this light sail project. Suitable by the, the sure. Planetary well, Society, I believe. Life, we um, you can get light sail, micro, mini, mini, mini satellites so that are just super, super tiny with a light sail on them and uh, accelerate them with lasers so that they could get to, you know, the nearest star. Um, so it's it's come it's come <laughs> all the way into really interesting terrain now because, of course, we have miniaturized our electronics a lot since 2003. So I don't know if you all remember the old 2003, you know, um, I don't know, terminals that people used to have for computers, but they were not the size of, of computers now. So we have a lot that we can do in a very small space, um, which makes it even easier to, to do more, do more with less. Um, but that said, it <laughs> doesn't, doesn't seem to stop uh, some folks doing more with more. So I think we'll have a little time for that news article later. Planet, like Mars, um, but let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and switch um, the switch themes here. So before we get any farther today, let me go ahead and remind you all that you are listening to York Universe, broadcasting live from the LNA Carswell Observatory, located at York University in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Our crew is over on our website, showing you wonderful pictures for OPV, yorku.ca, slash science, slash observatory. So you can join in now, ask them questions in the chat. Okay. That's an interesting possibility. Um, ask really them what they think about small satellites or anything else you want. Tonight you are listening to yeah. Dr. Elena Hyde and Blake Nankro, and we're currently discussing this week in space and astronomy history and launches and fun stuff. So let's go ahead and get started with uh, an even more fun topic. So we talked a little bit about this in some of our news items things that people can see during different times of the year. Um, and since, Blake, we've got you back here, I'd love to briefly get you to talk a little bit about the RASC Observing Certificate Program that we have here in Canada. Sure. The Royal Astronomical Society of Canada has a number of observing certificate programs. And, and there's kind of something for everyone. Uh, if if you surf into rask.ca and hover over the observing menu, you can click on the observing programs and you'll find lots of information there. And and these are visual observing programs. We also have astrophotography ones, but I'm talking about the visual ones. And, and we have a program called Explore the Universe. There are two Explore the Moon programs. There's a Messier catalog, the finest NGC objects. Our newest program is Double Stars. We have the Isabel Williamson Lunar Observing Program, quite challenging, and two other challenging programs, Deep Sky, Deep Sky Gems and Deep Sky Challenge. Within the uh, okay, so uh, again, the anyone, the anybody could use any of these observing systems, programs, if for nothing else, a, um, a checklist uh, to, uh, to, to use for a campaign. If you like looking at things, but you feel like you're not challenged, you, you need some new things to look at, you could pick one of these lists and start hammering away at it. Yes. So, so that's kind of nice. That and I need that when I do observing. I, I need, you know, some challenges. I need a checklist. I need a target list. Um, I I observed all the Messier objects over many years, and and I was very pleased to accomplish that. And and when I was learning or 
teaching myself how to use robotic telescopes and do LRGB processing, I was looking for, a, again, a project list, something to work towards, so I used the finest NVC program. Now, if you're a RASC member, if you're a member of the Society for these observing programs, you may be certified. So you can work on any of these programs, and upon completion, upon your materials being reviewed, uh, then you can receive a certificate form um, that's suitable for framing. And some of the programs have uh, a lapel pin, a metal uh, attractive pin, multicolor, that you can wear on your tilly hat or your vest or whatever. Um, so, so uh, again, for these programs to actually be certified, one must be a RASC member. But there's an exception to that. The first one that I mentioned the Explore the Universe can be completed by anyone. Any human on planet Earth can pursue and complete the Explore the Universe program and then receive the certificate and PIN. So we quite like this program in the sense that it's a way for anybody or everybody that has just an inkling and a mild interest in astronomy me and wants to learn more, that it's an easy way to do that. that the program has the observer looking at constellations, getting to know some of the bright stars, observing the moon over time, understanding its motion and its phases, looking at objects in the solar system invariably. There's some planets that can be seen at any given time. We have a few deep sky objects, not too difficult, not too challenging. Arguably, none of the objects in the Explore the Universe program require a telescope, that these can be observed with your eye or with binoculars. So we like that about the program, too, that it's easy, very, very low sort of threshold. Um, if you have a telescope, great, there's a few other uh, of the more challenging deep sky objects. There's a number of double stars that are on the program as well, and a couple of sort of bonus or extra things like variable stars. Now, of all of those objects, there are 110 total that can be viewed. But to, again, to make it easy for people to get into this, we uh, have um, lowered the minimum requirement to 55. So there's 110 objects. You can view them all, and that's great. We will recognize that that extra effort. But to complete the program and be certified, you only need to view 55 objects minimum. So it's a great way to learn the sky, a great way to learn uh, or observe motion in the solar system. It's a great way to learn the basics of astronomy get to start to know your way around the sky. And we view it really as a stepping stone that if you want to do more, it's a great, great way to do that. Yeah, that sounds like a wonderful program for beginners. Mm -hmm. So uh, at RASC, we, you know, we want to get everybody fired up about astronomy. Um, and uh, You're listening to Western we, we, uh, we've made this program available to all members and non-members so that they can start to experience that enjoyment and, and satisfaction of, of seeing celestial objects and learning the sky. And you, I mean, you do that too, right? You're always promoting. Oh, yeah. Well, and we love, we love people to go and uh, watch things. And as you say, you know, um, it's, it's always take the, take the time if you can to go ahead and look up at it because you never know, like maybe you'll get lucky and they'll see a bull light meteorite fly by. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and if you're following something like the Explore the Universe program, it can really help you get oriented and find out like, hey, are you happy just maybe doing a little bit of grazing once in a while? Or, you know, would it be a good idea to maybe think about a telescope at some point? Um, you know, this is a great way for people to get started. So I think it's a, I think it's wonderful. And um, I'm just really glad we have that resource out there for folks. Or I should say that RASC has that resource out there for folks. <laughs> 
Because <laughs> obviously you should go to the Rask website for that one. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so if they're going across the Explore the Universe, obviously that's a great list of objects for beginners to, to focus on. Is there anything else um, up at the moment that you would really recommend for beginners? Um, right, right now, uh, it's kind of... Um, um, how do I describe it? Planetary nebula season. Oh, <laughs> so that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. So galaxy season is May. There's lots of great galaxies to look at, but but now we're shifting into later in the season, and the galaxies are becoming harder to see or they're out of view. Uh, but but there's lots and lots of planetary nebula that we can look at. And, and, and all of these are very well placed right now, um, quite high in the sky in the middle of the evening, like around midnight or one o'clock. So some, some of the, uh, and they have great names too. There's the Turtle Nebula, there's the Cat's Eye, which contains water the and blue racquetball, the blue the snowball, yes, out of season, but nevertheless, in our summer sky. The, the blue, sat blue snowball is amazing, yeah, I have to say. I, I, I have had a lot of fun with imaging that one. I, I don't know about binoculars, but it's um, it's really, really fun for imaging. Yeah, the Saturn Nebula mm. is another one, and the blinking planetary nebula. Now, you, you asked about easy and in binoculars, and and these might be uh, ch challenging because in general, planetary nebulas are very small compared compared to say galaxies or open clusters or things like that. But you'll know sometimes when you're viewing a, a planetary nebula, even at low power, because of its very distinctive color. So that's a neat thing. A lot of times when we look at galaxies, even in a big telescope, there's no color. It's just this gray, fuzzy blob. But when we look at a planetary nebula, they're often bright green or bright, bright blue. So that, that's pretty neat. You're looking at some stars and you go, whoa, what's that weird blue thing right there? If you're fortunate to have a telescope and be able to use higher magnification, more powerful eyepieces, then you can make a planetary nebula magnified such that you can start to see some of the detail. Now, I mentioned the, the turtle nebula. Um, the reason it's called that is because there's four little blobs that stick out from the circular pattern of the planetary nebula. So it makes it look like feet uh, from from that uh, creature that we know. And the cat's eye nebula has this oval shape with kind of a dark region in the middle. So it's very evocative of the pattern we see um, in a cat's eye. Planetary nebula are expired stars. They're, they're at their end of their life, and to be uh, blunt or a bit crass, they're sort of burping and popping. <laughs> I, I, I've never heard it described as burping. But now they're belching out material over time. That's, that's an excellent, yep, I, exactly, yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> so we get these spheres or rings of material. They're usually bilobed, um, so they're, they're sort of um, a very symmetrical look to them if, if we can see it from the right angle. Um, sometimes they're sort of face on, but sometimes they're sideways. Um, there's lots of great ones that that um, have been captured by the various space telescopes like Hubble, and again, I've got those on my screensavers. And again, the, these are things that amateurs uh, visually and imagers can can capture, and um, they're they're fantastic to look at. But again, they are a little challenging in that they're small. So maybe just out of reach of binoculars. But a small telescope will start to pull in some of that color and that it's clearly not a star. It's It's got some dimension and, and some texture to it. And again, enjoy enjoy those colors. Try to see if you can uh, detect those green and blue colors, which is kind of rare to see.
present day. Yes, exactly. I mean, of course, your your color sensitivity for any any human eye uh, is going to be much less than your your black and white sensitivity. So, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to tease out color and so nice when we finally can. It can eventually mm-hmm. flow back up to the surface. And um, so the I think spring, uh, we don't have a lot of time uh, left. So I'm going to just make it a little bit of here. Blake's mm-hmm. choice what <laughs> so, yeah, uh, what we should choose next. Do you want to talk a little bit more about uh, sky support. objects? Well, you'd have to have something out of the atmosphere. To um, water, even transient yeah, on the surface. Yeah. But. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm just sort of drawing a blank what, what here. Well, we did have some. You had some practical uh, tips for stargazing. We could we could go through that. I mean, obviously, it's smaller and gravity lower. Um, okay, I haven't mentioned some of these before. Some quick things off the top of my head. Um, uh, dark, dark adaptation is really important when you're doing astronomy. Um, so that means when you want to observe with your eyes or binoculars or a telescope, um, it, you need to consider that it takes some time for your your eyes to adjust. You can't just walk outside from the house and, and aim the binoculars up at something and expect to see it in, in any great detail. Um, you have to be patient. You have to wait. I'm sorry, but you got to wait about 20 minutes or more. And what you're doing there, it's a couple of things. There's physiological things, but also chemical things that are happening within the eye that you need to accommodate for. And, and all the while, you're tempted to grab your smartphone. Don't do it. In the meantime, <laughs> so you got to avoid using the phone yeah. as much as possible. Now, when I, some new phones do have a night vision mode yeah. that you can turn it into. Um, if you've got night vision mode, still turn the screen brightness way down. That's yeah. So you know, I'm a computer junkie, and I'm I'm looking up things on the computer while I'm doing astronomy. So I I have a well, kind of a multi-pronged um, a, attack for this. I get the screen brightness as low as possible. I put the software in red mode or I put the computer in red mode, but I also apply a layer of plastic red film over top of the computer screen to further attenuate or dim the screen. And that combination of things works very well for me. So you can get this red plastic film in, in a variety of places. The, the good stuff that I use is available from theater companies. Uh, but you can also go to, you know, kind of the gift kind of stores like Michael's, and you can get red film. And if you put that over your computer screen or over your smartphone screen, that further dims the light and that will help so it's one of the big things you gotta get your eyes um, adjusted and when you are working outside and you need to sort of not bonk into furniture or you want to look at a paper chart you need a red flashlight so you can buy ones that have red leds in them or you can once again put red film over the lens of the flashlight to make it a deep red color so those are a couple of things off the top of my head. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, we're not going to have time to discuss uh, light podcast. pollution in general, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, I will just say that wavelength of light matters a lot and not just for night adaption, but um, having red film and red flashlights and having lower light intensity means that you're actually able better to see in dark conditions because your eyes don't react the same to red light as they do to blue light. If you were to make your star charts blue and your film blue, um, you would actually wreck your night vision. It would kind of give you, and you'd be blind to the background. Um, this is why blue lights are bad, and that's my, my one second TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> Wavelength matters a lot. Um, so if, if you're going out and doing anything in low light conditions, or if you're driving anywhere, um, you know, do do everybody a favor and stay away from blue lights. Um, they're they're very very bad for your for your night vision and for your ability to actually discern uh, details. Um, blue lights are not um, yeah blue lights are okay if you're in very very bright conditions, but not so much if it's any any kind of darkness. 
Um, all right, so Blake, I'll just give you any final notes before we sign off for this evening. No, I can't think of anything. All right, well, wonderful. Well, I'm just going to take a quick second to thank our guest, Blake Nankro, for coming on once again. It's been absolutely amazing to pick his brain about all kinds of great stuff. Um, so thank you very much. And we're going to go ahead and um, tell everyone, uh, you have been listening to York Universe, the astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. The hosts this evening have been Blake Nankro and myself, Dr. Elena Hyde. Stay tuned because it is Astronomy Night in Canada. Coming up next is Quirks and Quirks, Western World, and Science for the People. I'll go ahead and tell you that we can still find show notes, content updates, and contact info over on yorku.ca slash science slash observatory. If you have any questions, thanks for tuning in to York Universe tonight. Clear skies and Plus, have a good night. Hunting music made from iceberg research and a study that could change the course of Alzheimer's treatment. All this and more today on Quirks and Quarks. You know,